Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to our talk. Um, so I'm Pierfilio Gerardini. I work at the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, and I'm going to be giving you this talk today with Ben Campos, the work for Cognitive. So before we start into going into the, you know, doing a deep dive on how we use enclosure for tidying data science workflows, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy is and what, what we're trying to do. So the Parker Institute, or PICE for short, is a nonprofit that was started by Sean Parker with really a vision to transform the way medical research is done and turn all cancers into curable diseases. So the way that we're working toward this vision is really centered around collaboration. So PISI is effectively a network of the leading institution in these fields, in this field, including Memorial Sloan Kettering, Stanford, UCSF, UCLA, UPenn, MD Anderson, and Dana Farber, plus others, and also of the leading investigators in this field, such as uh, the, uh, this year Nobel Prize winner, Jim Allison, and many other um, top experts in this field. And really, the, the, the whole idea of the Institute is to bring these people together into a network, into a collaborative network, so that we can deliver impactful therapies to patients faster and more efficiently. So besides this institution, there is also a central office in San Francisco, which is where I work. And uh, the office provides a variety of support for the activities of the Institute, including IP support, legal support, op uh, research operation support, clinical development support, which means running clinical trials and all the infrastructure that's required for that, as well as informatics and data science, which obviously has to do with analyzing all the data that comes out of these studies, and that's where uh, the, the team that I work in is the informatics team. <clears throat> so our, the activities of the Institute are really centered around three main pillars. So on one hand, we're really heavily science-driven, and we want to fuel both research. And so we want to see what happens if we give the top scientists in this field the resources and the, and the tools that they need to pursue their boldest and most innovative ideas. Then, obviously, we want to be able to translate these ideas into clinical studies that are going to change clinical practice. So a big part of what we do as, as the Institute is taking discoveries that have been made by our investigators and others in the field and develop clinical studies that try to turn these discoveries into actual therapies. And then, Last but not least, another uh, important component of what we're doing is trying to find a pathway to our com commercialization of these therapies, because commercialization at the end of the day is the way that you know, all drugs get from, from, a, from a clinical study, which is a relatively small set of patients, to the broader community in general. So our work really goes back and forth between all, uh, these, these three different areas. And really, today, the work that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today really is in, is in the two pillars. So how do we do research and how do we um, develop clinical programs and trying to understand what happens in, in patients when we give these therapies to patients. So the institute is called Park Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, so we are obviously very excited about immunotherapy. And you know, some of you might have heard of, of, uh, of this technology in, in the news because it's, it's really the hot thing in cancer research right now. And the reason why we are so excited about that is because we really believe that this is the first approach that has really curative potential for cancer. And you know, it's durable, it's adaptable because the immune system can evolve alongside the cancer. It's targeted because it's very specific uh, towards the uh, targeting the immune cells. It's systemic, so it has the power to work in, in metastatic disease because it will, you know, your, your immune cells circulate all throughout the body so they can you know, attack cancer, whatever in the body. It's synergistic because it can be combined with other modality of therapies, and it's also universal because it has the potential to work in all cancers. And really, immunotherapy in general is the idea of using your own immune system to fight the cancer. And you know, the, the challenge that really the field has right now is to make it work for all cancers and not and all patients, and not just a subset, a subset of cancer or a subset of patients. So. A large part of what we do is trying to identify which patients are going to respond to the therapy, which patients are not going to respond to the therapy, and what can we do for the patients that do not respond or for the cancer indication where the therapy doesn't really work. Um, so a, a core part of our activities involves collecting molecular data from blood and tumor samples that we obtained from, from, from patients in our studies. And then what we do with these samples is we, we run a lot of different molecular assays to really try and profile both the cancer and the immune system as deeply as possible. And these assays include stuff such as genome sequencing, gene expression profiling, 
and also different technology to image the tumor and, and you know, really visualize the structure of the tumor, as well as um, multiple technology for doing immune profiling. So uh, getting blood from a patient and then figuring out what, what, what really are the characteristics and the activation of the immune system. And so all these molecular data, so I'm gonna right now, from, from now on refers to this corpus of data as molecular data. So this molecular data gets combined with clinical data, which is, the, which is information about you know, what, what kind of treatment this patient received, what kind of disease they had exactly, and what was re the response to the treatment, et cetera. And the idea is to combine all these things together into that, you know, into a, a gray box that's on the right there, the, which is the informatics team that has to figure out what's going on essentially, and that's, that's uh, our, our day job. Um, so, you know, we, we have, I wanted to give you a little bit of a, of a flavor for those of you that haven't worked with this data, what, what does a typical data set that we work with look like? Because this is very different from, from data that, from what you think big data and other domains. <clears throat> So a typical data set, which might be the result from a study, so say that we have run a clinical trial, the clinical trial is now over, and we have all these samples that we have collected, and we want to do molecular analysis to figure out what happened in this patient when, we were when they were given these therapies. So a typical data set might look something like this. There might be 50 or, or so subjects, and then we will have se several tables of molecular measurements that have been done on these subjects. So imagine between 10 and 20,000 feature per each sub subject for five to seven different measurement types. So a table might be all the gene expression information for this subject, and another table might be the abundance of all the different cell types in the blood, et cetera, et cetera. And we will have different tables for each subject containing measurements that have been derived using different experimental technologies. So one interesting characteristic of this data is that it's very deeply interrelated, because we are measuring, both because we are measuring the same Thing, same biological things in multiple ways, but also because you know some of these data might, for instance, represent the abundance of different immune cells in the blood, and some other data might be molecules or factors that these cells secrete in the blood, right? So you, you need to imagine all these data sets have been has been deeply interrelated because that, because of because of this uh, of this fact. Also, unfortunately, another characteristic of this data is it's very sparse. Because, because all these data sets are generated from patients that obviously are very sick. So it happens very often that you know, somebody couldn't come in for their biopsy and so we won't have tissue for that patient. Or somebody had to skip a, a cycle of treatment because of toxicity and so we won't have, we won't have data for that patient, right? So the data is, is because we're dealing with a, with, a very complicated, uh, with a very complicated logistics of collecting these samples and then uh, shipping out for running this assay, the data is usually very highly sparse. So internally, we like to say that this data is not big because at the end of the day, it's not a lot of data in, 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 uh, you know, in bytes, but it's deep because it's really complicated, it's deeply interrelated, and it's noisy, and it's sparse, and you know, biological data is, is ex extremely, extremely complicated because the biological domain is really complicated. So this is what the data set look like, you know, what a typical data set look like. So what we normally want to do with this data set is one of these three things. So one could be we want to identify a specific subset of patients. So we want to identify in all the data that we are collected, which are the patients that have uh, metastatic disease, have been treated with a drug called nivolumab, and have an, a, a certain mutation in a, in a gene of interest. Okay, so identifying a specific cohort of patients through a combination of molecular and clinical data. <clears throat> Another thing that is usually of interest is if we make a new observation in a new data set, we want to see if this observation has ever been made before. So for instance, if we discover that the expression of gene X is higher in patients that respond to the therapy, we want to see have we ever seen this thing before in other data sets. And then last but not least is the idea of building predictive models that gives us insight into the mechanism of action of these different therapies, right? So if we can combine all this data, to build a model that tells us the patients that are going to respond have these characteristics. Not only this is useful in terms of clinical practice, but it's also very useful to figure out what to do about the patients that did not respond to the therapy, right? So figuring out which, which features give you a prediction of response can also be very useful in terms of developing new clinical programs to address patients that don't have these features and don't respond to the therapy. So in order to uh, do all of this data analysis, we have built this tool that we call CANDLE for Cancer Data and Evidence Library, which is really a, a, really a platform for biological data science, and that's gonna be the meat of the talk. And we, this was a collaboration between the Parkinson Institute and Cognitech, and obviously relies heavily on the atomic enclosure. And 
you know, the main characteristic of, of this, of this uh, platform are four. So one is the idea is to really break down the silos between different types of molecular and clinical data. So I'm sure that you all have heard about data silos and data silos in biology are particularly siloed. So you might have completely different databases that, that handle the clinical information or the gene expression information, et cetera. They might be living all in different systems. Instead, we wanted to bring them all together in a single system so that we can do queries and analysis that really span both domains. So we, we might look at patients that have a certain characteristic and have been treated with a certain uh, drug and then have a certain molecular profile. And we want to be able to do all of this in the same system in, uh, um, so that we can really leverage the, the database for doing complex queries. <clears throat> Another important thing, thing is that we work as a team and we want to make sure that the whole team is working on the same data. So when we do this analysis, we don't want to be in the situation where I have a spreadsheet on my computer that's called gene expression final final VT, V2, and then Ben has a data set that's like gene expression final 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 V3, and we think we're working on the same thing, but we're actually looking at different data. So this is very important, once again, because most of the work that we've done is, is teamwork, really. And clearly, uh, closely related to this is the idea of making analysis code reusable across projects. So a lot of time when data science work is done, is done in an academic lab, what happens is that you might have a, a postdoc or a graduate student that writes a lot of code on his computer to do some analysis, and then you know, the computer, the, the person leaves the lab, and basically the code is, is, is not usable anymore. And this is because you know, that code was probably tied to the specific of how the data was in, when it was in, in his computer. There might be specific file names or specific column names, et cetera. So when you move to a different project, all of your data changes in shape, and so the code is not really reusable. Instead, what we want to do here is that by having the data, a consistent data model that's provided by the, the atomic database, if we write all of our code against this consistent data model, it means that the code is going to be reusable as we move from project to project, and also as we move from team member to team member, right? So I might not be a, a big expert in analyzing gene expression data, but maybe there is somebody in my team that's very expert in analyzing gene expression data and can write some modeling function that I can then use in my analysis because the, because the, the code is not tied to the specifics of, of the data in his laptop, but it's really pulled in from a consistent data model in the database. And also, and I'm sure yeah, this will resonate with whoever is used Datomic, we really want to keep a history of all the data that was ever entered in the database to have analytical reproducibility. There's lots of articles right now about reproducibility crisis in science, so the idea of being able to publish a result today and then two years from now go back and obtain the same result is very important in science in general and definitely, definitely for us. So we, as I said, we used Datomic to build this platform. We're going to give you a little bit more details of, of how we built it. But before we go into that, I wanted to uh, give you um, a few bullet points of why we choose Datomic specifically. So one very, probably the most important thing for us is that this, there is a schema, but that the schema is malleable to change. Because what happens is that, you know, biological data is really complicated, and our understanding of the biological domain is con constantly evolving. And so we are going to be running assays a year from now that don't even exist today. So there is no way that we can build a schema, a fixed schema that can anticipate the shape of all the data forever to come. And so having a schema, so having some sort of rigidity, but at the same time having the flexibility to evolve the schema was really probably the most important um, thing for us. The other, which I just mentioned, is obviously the, uh, having time as a first class concept in the database is really useful for having analytical reproducibility. Performance, we were very satisfied with the, with the performance that, that, that we got from Datomic. So that's, you know, as part of our technical evaluation, we did some performance testing. We were very, very happy with that. Also, last but not least, two other things that are related to programming against the database. One, of, one is the expressiveness of the query language. We really like uh, Datalog, and we think it's a very easy way to navigate a network of, of complicated data. And also the ergonomics of the API, really pro programming against the API proved to be um, very, very intuitive, even for a non-closure specialist like me initially. So obviously, there isn't just a database, but there is a database and associated tooling. And this gives a little bit of, a, of, a, of an idea of what is our candle universe, as we like to talk it, to, to, to talk about it. So on the, on the left side, we have a bunch of tools that are used for ETL, so for taking heterogeneous data set, pre-process them, and load them into the atomic. And, and Ben is going to give more detail about that. And on the right side, we have a, um, a bunch of different tools that we use to interface our R 
data science environment with Datomic, and that's, that's gonna be something that we're going to be uh, talking about in the rest of the talk as well. So now I'll leave it to Ben to give you a little bit more uh, uh, an idea of the different closure components of this system. So hi everyone, quick volume check here. I'm Ben, I work at Cognitect. Uh, and I've been partnered with Parker Institute on this particular project. Uh, Federico, Federico discussed some of the components of the Candle universe here. I'm going to focus in first on the importer and then uh, on the query logic. Uh, I'm going to go through the first part, the importer, fairly quickly. If you're interested in a deeper technical dive, uh, we also gave a talk at Strange Loop. That one was me and uh, Lacey Kitch at the Parker Institute. Um, there, we could work through a lot of more detailed examples on the way the uh, import config and everything else works. I'm just going to go through some highlights uh, for this next section here. So my goal is to give enough context so that the other parts make sense. Um, quick datomic refresher slash intro single slide thing for people that may not be familiar. Uh, datomic um, has its model built out of datums. Uh, you can read a datum as uh, for an entity, here's an attribute with a particular value that's asserted or attracted at a particular point in time. Um, if you've seen RDF or triple stores, there are some things in common with that and some additional enhancements. Uh, and here it is kind of living out the sort of RDF dream of this can be a target for lots of different disparate data sources to point to. Sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse back. Let's see, and the important here is you can accrete a fact store out of these flat datums over time, and then at any particular point in time, you can project out a consistent database and ask analytical questions of that database. So I spoke about you know, the fact that from uh, these different datums, you can project things out into entities and out into rectangles, and you can project from entities and rectangles into the datums. Uh, and this is important because we've got lots of different tables and other formats out in the wild that we're trying to target to get into this common schema. Uh, the original source data might come from flat binary files, tables, JSON, XML, web services. Someone in R has gone through and analyzed it and produced different tables that consolidate this information. Uh, and if we just try to naively put that elsewhere, um, we have this kind of uneven data set. So, Again, you know, if you've seen this kind of stuff in SQL, it's like, yeah, I could go through and I can make, you know, tons of different tables and join them all together different ways and set up different views. And sometimes these views have to be um, hit very frequently. So these need to be indexed. And then maybe there's a caching layer past that. Um, a lot of that stuff, we just don't have any of that complexity. We put it into datums. And the indexes that Datomic provides uh, are efficient for our use case, which is a very join-heavy, very relational uh, workflow. Um, yeah, so this is all, all this uneven data goes into a flat schema of datums um, without much difficulty, and this is getting it into a common schema is important. Again, this is the big bet that Pisces has, is if once we get all this stuff together, we break down the silos, we can start asking more interesting questions and find patterns that have previously eluded people just because the infrastructure to ask those questions hasn't been there yet. Um, of course, you know, it's not just, oh yeah, there are datums, therefore wave your magic wand and now all your data is into Datomic. Um, again, the strange loop talk goes into a lot of different detail there, but the important thing I want to stress is that this is one data driven. So there's not a whole lot, you know, the data scientist might have to do some data cleaning in R, uh, but once they are started producing these tables, this is one big config Eden file that drives the entire import. Uh, the second thing is the way we've built it, it's schema agnostic, so it expects a certain sort of structure, but there's actually a layer of data annotations in the datomic schema that, in this datomic schema that tells it how to go about um, building the import job given the config file. Uh, so in this particular case, we have you know, medical data that has um, certain expectations, I'm just gonna skip a slide for a second, has certain expectations about the structure in the data um, but that structure is something 
that you could define a different structure just so long as it happened to be this kind of tree-shaped uh, relationships between entities. Um, the biggest challenge that's part of this, that a lot of this facilitates, is trying to deal with identifying the same thing, um, doing identifiers. So if you've ever worked with like a big machine learning data set, you've seen some variation of this problem. I'm trying to discuss the performance of my model, and I, what I can say is, oh, this is row three in this data set. Uh, and that's not a particularly useful way to talk about an observation. Uh, and a lot of times, in this case, we're pulling out data from elsewhere, and it has some name or ID. It's a row number. It's an arbitrarily assigned kind of standards name. And it's not globally unique. It's only unique within a particular scope or context. Um, so we, we need to resolve that. And we need to resolve that in such a way that when we build out all the references in Datomic, everything that's referring to the same entity actually refers to one entity that has all the right attributes on it. We don't have hanging references here and there or things that were supposed to point at this and end up pointing at this instead. So a lot of the meat in the importer is about keeping the references aligned the correct way. Um, the mechanism for doing that is something that we call the meta model. Uh, if anybody's used Datomic Analytics and that new functionality, it's gotten a lot easier to talk about what we do with the meta model because it's sort of the opposite. The Datomic Anal Analytics um, meta schema information lets you go from Datomic into tables for, uh, uh, for the, the Presto driver in this case, but that's you know, the general functionality. In our case, with the meta model, we are going from different tables into uh, Datomic. So the meta model says which kinds of things there are in the schema and which things relate to other things and in what way they do. And for those things that have a unique identifier, how do we construct that within the particular context of this data set? And again, this, this data annotation layer is what lets us do the import into Datomic in an entirely um, schema agnostic way. Uh, for the machinery. We just, you know, the config file reflects the schema and the meta model ensures that that constraint is achieved. Now, of course, getting all this data into Datomic doesn't do a lot of good if you can't ask a bunch of interesting questions about it later so that you can pull out this highly relational structure. Um, again, part of Pisces' mission here is to empower analysts and that means meeting a lot of people in their existing workflow so we have tooling for allowing them to use uh, data log from R, as well as some you know, additional R libraries and tooling on top of that. Um, the, the big thing here is you know, asking somebody to step out entirely of their workflow and use closure and leave the modeling tools behind, et cetera. That's not, you know, it's really hard to get started with that sort of a proposition. And it's not even, you know, for Parker, it's not the goal. The goal is to empower this in whatever uh, tool chain it makes sense to do that. So we've provided reach to, data, to Datomic from the R ecosystem, and these principles can also be applied in other data science contexts and languages when these sort of uh, constraints apply. Uh, so, so one portion of this is that we uh, accept queries over the wire using a query service. Um, so the sources for the queries, these can be built in R directly using the data log parser. There's also a visual query building environment called in Flame that lets you do sort of like a block assembly of queries and query shapes. Um, the supporting closure infrastructure behind that is one, we allow data log queries to be serialized over plain JSON data, so we don't require that people adopt a semantically rich serialization library like uh, Transit or Eden or one of those where the semantics of that library may not be a good fit for the way uh, the data scientist is doing things. Uh, we also provide a m means for uh, improving some of these ad hoc or generated queries as well. So we have a Datomic query. I, I should say very cautiously, it's like an improvement suggestor, suggestion generator uh, that gives you alternate queries. It's not a true optimizer, but it does fix a lot of bad queries that uh, are put together naively. If the query is already awesome, it's not going to do you anything for you. Uh, so both of these things will be open, we've open sourced, uh, Federico will talk about this. Uh, the plain JSON parser leverages spec, so it implements a kind of overlap subset of the query grammar to disambiguate difficult cases. So the primary function of the uh, plain JSON query parser is 
there are only a few cases where, you, where the exact parsing behavior doesn't fall out of like a simple lexing pass. Uh, so you know, if I pass symbols as strings that begin with question marks, and if I pass keywords as string elements that uh, start with the colon, and if I otherwise use the existing JSON collection structure, that's sufficient um, to actually do a full parse to datomic data log um, the full query structure, except for things like the, um, the case of predicate expressions, aggregates, these sort of things where there are symbols that might be unadorned um, otherwise that show up. So uh, the use of spec means that we can simply recurse through the collections and check to see when we match the predicates for those particular case and conditionally parse those symbols that are whitelisted to be parsed in those contexts. Um, so that's, you know, again, if you have to provide reach to data science teams or other people to use uh, data log directly, this is a piece of platform that's coming out. Um, the next is the query improver is based on two heuristics and just, you know, to do the Datomic product team of service, both of these things are listed in Datomic best practices. So if you, know, if you read the expletive manual, you could just write this sort of logic uh, yourself for your own platform. Um, the first is we look at scheduling clauses in the order that maximizes the use of previous bindings. Um, so for joining, joining along, if, if you look at the query on the left, if I introduce a new clause that doesn't reuse other bindings, it matches a whole unique separate set of things and you can end up with a product between those if you keep building up the query naively from there. If we enforce the order so that the next clause reuses an, a previous binding, uh, that obviates one category of badness from generated queries and like ad hoc queries from the R workflow. Um, the second one is that you know, we use a set of statistics about how many datums there are for any particular attribute. Uh, from the client API, you can actually get this right now. I don't, I don't think it's documented, but it's in the DB stats map. Um, you can also calculate it lazily with datums behind the scenes as well. We have an example that does that, especially if you're stuck in a peer library context. Uh, but the important thing is that you can get all of these attributes and then within the join along logic, just rank things based on which attributes match the most. Now, there's no sophisticated behavior around if you're in like an and or an or join or if you're in um, some context where you have like an in binding where something's gonna be most bound even though the attributes aren't that high. Again, the goal is not full optimization, um, though it is something that we expect to have up and you know, if, you're, if it's something you're interested in riffing on further, you could make contributions to improving the space. But I will say the goal for the library is not to take the place of like a SQL optimizer or something like that. It's just to be away at dev time or with tough corner cases like generated queries to improve those so those don't become uh, performance issues. Uh, so that's the last set of my section on the infrastructure. I'll turn it over back to Federico here to discuss the RDSL. So as Ben mentioned, you know, what we really wanted to do with this, with this work was enabling the uh, data science team that worked in R. So there was no way that we're gonna convince these people to learn how to program in Clojure. So the only way really to go about this was really to meet them where they are in R. And also, uh, truth be told, there is, there is a, especially for biological data analysis, there is like a gigantic corpus of uh, uh, R modeling packages that, you know, it was just unfeasible for us to think that we will be able to reproduce all of that in Clojure. And so we decided to, to do the opposite ways and uh, go the opposite way and bring this Clojure environment to R. So really, what we built is a system that allows you to issue data log queries from within R. So what you had on the left is one of the mBrain's, uh, mbrain's music example queries uh, as, it look, as it looks in Clojure and uh, um, in, in natively in Clojure. And the thing on the right is that basically the, D, the DSL that we, we built to um, uh, enable to us to issue the same query in R. So as you can see, it's pretty, pretty similar. It's not strings, so we're not just, you know, writing everything as a string and sending it over, over the wire. We are just, um, you know, we, we are using symbols and expressions in, in R. There are a few differences, a few differences that are um, summarized here, which uh, have to do with the, with the fact that this expression still has to be valid R, R syntax. So for instance, operators, we're not using prefix operator, we're using infix operators. Uh, uh, expression, function calls look slightly different. Uh, 
uh, you know, the blank variable, which is an underscore in, uh, in, uh, in, in the datomic closure dialect, is a dot in R, and all the keywords name are omitting the initial uh, column. But aside from that, you know, things look pretty similar. And that D function that, that you see in R is basically the function that constrict, cons constructs a single data log clause. And then, you know, that's, that's the way the whole query gets assembled. And uh, that last call, do query, is what actually takes this data and sends it over the wire to get, to get um, a response from the database. So the nice thing about this is that the, the data is then returned to the user directly within the R session. So it would be a native R object. It could be a matrix or a vector of data frame, depending on the shape of the data. But it's native R, and so you can immediately take it and use any R package to work with it, to work with it for plotting or modeling or whatever. So really, as, as a user of the system, you can leverage the power of data log, but you never have to leave R to, to, to do any of this work. So as I said, the data loss, the, 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 the data log queries in R are, are data. So they're really data structure, not strings. And this means that it, it's really easy to um, combine, and combine them and construct them programmatically. So I have an example of that, of what I mean by that. And, oh, and uh, as, uh, as Ben mentioned, this, so these queries are data in R and then get serialized to JSON. And there's a ton of already existing packages for serializing R data structure to JSON. So then the JSON gets sent to the server the server responds with another JSON, and the JSON gets the serialized on the R side from, from JSON into a native R object. And for this, all this JSON serializing and deserializing, we're using standard uh, R libraries. So the fact that queries are data can be built programmatically is very useful because in a, lot, in, a, in a lot of cases, what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide our users with pre-configured queries that they, can, that they can run without even having to do any data log. You just have a function call that executes a query in the background. And so when we write this function ourselves, we want to you know, be able to write, write code in a flexible way. So for instance, what we have here is we have a query, a big query, that there's different, uh, uh, that's not pictured here. So imagine there's some sort of up, upstream big query. And then we want to add different fragments to this query depending on other clauses that are present in the query, right? So for instance, that thing that says there variant clause, that's an example of a leader fragment that we want to add to the query depending on the type of some other uh, clauses in the query. So that switch statement, you know, essentially switches to different building blocks that we can add to the query. And then there is a function in the R system that's called cQuery that allows you to combine the extra clauses with, with the bigger query. So obviously all of this is facilitated by the fact that these are data structure. If this was this were string, this would be much harder. Uh, the DSL really takes advantage of R Lisp origins because you know R uh, used to be a Lisp. And, uh, and um, uh, the fact that symbol and expression can be captured and before evaluation and manipulated, so there's lots of facility for computing the language. One of the restrictions is obviously that the, the, the expressions st still need to be valid R syntax. So that's the reason why you see these little syntactic differences between native data log, closure slash data log, and, and what we've built is because we are still constrained by the fact that there are some things that are legal in closure that are simply not legal in R syntax. Uh, we also implemented a way to have the pool syntax, so we can do pool queries from R, um, and that's once again there is a there is a um, you know a little table of differences between between the the closure syntax and the R syntax, mostly due to the fact that R doesn't really have data literals, so we had to do some 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 changes there. But you can uh, you know aside from that, this allows you to uh, very easily convert a pool expression that you might get uh, in a closure or data log and convert it to the R side. So as Ben mentioned, we are open sourcing some of the element of the system that we think might be of general use. And these are the, the three repos that we're up. One is this R library to query the atomic and generate data log queries from R. Uh, the other one is the data log JSON parser that um, um, Ben talked about that also contains a very minimalistic example server app of how you could stand up the system yourself. And then a library to uh, suggest uh, improvement to the, the atomic queries based on, uh, based on heuristics. I want to stress out the fact that this is not meant to be the end all be all solution for interfacing R with the atomic. This is something we've been using internally, we found very useful, and we're putting it out there in case that other people are uh, you know, interested in the approach and want, want, to, want to use it themselves for, for what they're doing. But we, we very much uh, welcome comments and improvements, and we know there is, there is lots of work still that needs to be done. But we wanted to put it out there as a, as a way to um, you know, solicit feedback and ho hopefully inspire other people to do something similar with R and Atomic. 
<clears throat> so last but not least, the acknowledgement slide, I want to particularly give a shout out to Lacey Keach, which is in the audience that's been involved with this project uh, since the beginning. Uh, and on the Cognitex side, Ben, Kurt, uh, Marshall, and George, and also uh, we had some very useful initial input from uh, uh, Stu and Rich. So in conclusion, the, the, the whole idea of this project is really to leverage closure and atomic unique data modeling and processing primitives upstream of standard data science tools. So that's what we're trying to do is to bring the closure ecosystem in a data science workflow when we can leverage its usefulness to the max. This is, uh, uh, you know, I want to stress that this is not at all a way to use R from closure. It's quite the opposite. It's a way to use R, but to leverage closure and atomic unique capabilities in, in your workflow. So with that, we'll be happy to take any question. I think we have five minutes. So thank you. Thank you.